Hello and welcome to the Smart Tech Podcast. I'm here with R Blank. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank you, Nick. It's a real pleasure to be here. So for people people not initially familiar with your work, uh, please let us know um, who you are, what's your background, uh, and how you've come to create also Shield Your Body. Maybe the two-minute version <laughs> rather than focusing all this conversation on your bio, but it's important because uh, your your father, uh, Martin Blank, PhD, is a was a very important EMF scientist who um, was a, uh, one of the first scientists that uh, convinced me that this is an issue. So uh, please go ahead. Sure. Yeah, no. So as you said, I, I uh, started and run a company called Shield Your Body or SYB. Um, about 10 years ago, I'd, I'd, I'd been working in software development for about 20 years, uh, mm -hmm. doing apps for companies like Apple and Microsoft and Mattel. And about 10 years ago, my father uh, was writing a book about EMF health effects. And unlike everything he'd written in his entire career, this one was actually meant for normal, regular human beings to, to understand. Yeah. <laughs> and so he asked me for some help because I, at that point, not only was I in engineering, uh, I, I taught at USC and I'd written a book. And so he asked me for some help and uh, I ended up co-writing the book with him. And in the course of writing that book, I, I learned a few things. Now, obviously, you know, my father being who he was, I was always aware of the EMF issue. Uh, and I knew, for instance, never to hold a cell phone up to my head and uh, never had a microwave. And, and in the rare ch times I used one, I knew to get very far away from it and things like that. But I didn't really understand yeah. the EMF issue until writing that book. And then that, was, that experience really showed me just how much science uh, had to say about the health effects, you know, because when it's covered in the media, it's often, you know, it, is our cell phones harmful and there's a debate raging and so forth. And if you actually look at the science, the science is very clear. There's a, a very, as you know, uh, a very large body of uh, very convincing high quality science showing that uh, these bio effects happen from even very, very low doses. At the same time, when you sit back and think about it, you know, you realize the sources of EMF in our lives, they, they, they aren't optional. They, they, are, they form the, the entire underpinning of modern society and the modern economy. So whereas you could ban tobacco and cigarettes tomorrow and the world would get on just fine, uh, you can't get rid of the sources of EMF. So I realized there had to be safer ways for people to use technology. And that's where the idea for what became SYB started and launched my first product in 2013. That's the, the pocket patch, which turns any pocket into a cell phone radiation shield. We still make and sell that. Uh, but now we have over 20 products uh, that we sell uh, through our website, as well as marketplace like Amazon, eBay in over 30 countries around the world. That's that's incredible. And I guess my question in you started this company almost 10 years ago, um, 10 years ago, it wasn't a popular topic in the news talking about cell phone. I mean, we had some controversy here and there, and even with the power lines at the beginning of the 2000s, uh, especially here in, with, with Hydro-Quebec and the controversies and the lawsuits and whatnot. But So it's been in the news on and off, but as a software engineer, did you get weird stares if you talked about it with colleagues? I mean, it's not a popular topic or, yeah, or ca California. it's considered fringe. Yeah, California, where I was at the time, um, is perhaps the least receptive population <laughs> in the world yeah. for this message, even even today. Um, and you know, when when we launched the Pocket Patch on Amazon in 2013, and you did a search to find it, it would come up alongside ghost detectors. Um, <laughs> fortunately, you know that landscape has shifted, um, but. The over time, the public response definitely, you know, has shifted. So when I do talk to people about it, you know, at a, a networking event or a party or dinner party, whatever, you know, it used to be, you know, they'd crack a joke uh, according, you know, per the title of your book, you know, about tinfoil hats. <laughs> yeah. um, and then increasingly and gradually, but increasingly over time, the responses went from those dismissive jokes to, yeah, you know, I feel a little weird about carrying this phone in my pocket. Or, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, I saw Sanjay Gupta did a special on that. Can, can, are these really dangerous? You know, and so people were much more receptive. Not only were they more receptive, increasingly it was obvious they were already thinking about this. They just kind of buried it a little bit. 
And so, yeah, the, the, the landscape for this message has definitely shifted in the last 10 years. There's a long way to go um, for a variety of reasons, you know, some of which we can, you know, touch on later if you'd like, but, but it, it's definitely changed uh, in the last decade. Yeah. And ironically, I think the landscape is, I don't know, it's been blurred a little bit with the pandemic the last two years, what I saw on 5G <laughs> online, unfortunately. I mean, I wrote my book and uh, you, you've been around for way more than I am, but it, five years ago, I started writing my book and writing, uh, reading Overpowered and Disconnect and everything that was out there to try to make make up my mind. And 5G wasn't around. It wasn't much in, in the discussion. I barely heard about the term 5G in 2016 and 17, but when the rollout started, uh, not many people talked about the dangers at all. Uh, and, and in the last two years, many things have been said about, about 5G. A lot of it that uh, was so speculative and uh, kind of over the top to me that I felt, oh my God, it, it's on one hand, it's good for awareness because people are starting to start starting to think about the electropollution. But did you see this? Like, how did you go through the last two years as far as your understanding of how awareness has increased? What was it? good that this happened the whole thing about 5g or was it detrimental because i've heard both sides from yeah, scientists I, and, and activists i think both things can be true there there yeah. it was good that there's increased awareness um but it's definitely harmful that there was so much misinformation a yeah i agree because people need accurate information but b because when misinformation becomes so dominant It gives the major platforms the excuse to start uh, censoring or deranking, changing yeah. policies to obscure the actual real information. I mean, you have to keep in mind, and again, I know, I know a lot of things I'm saying you already know, but in the, you have to keep, your listeners have to keep in mind, yeah. right? People like us who, who want to share awareness of what science actually has to say about this stuff and also to share solutions. Um, you know, the way in which we share these things today in 2021, 2022, all goes through platforms that profit off of EMF exposure. Now, they don't actually charge people for EMF exposure, but, you know, Facebook makes money off of delivering ads to you. That is done through a screen. Google makes money delivering uh, search results to you. That is done through a screen. Increasingly, these companies are making their own hardware. Uh, the the, the, uh, the Ray-Ban uh, stories, I think, the, the new Facebook glasses with Ray-Ban, the Ray-Ban stories, uh, Google Glass. I was, actually, I was actually a beta tester of Google Glass way back in the oh, day. Really? But these companies, not only uh, uh, their, fund, their, their basic business model relies on you being exposed to EMF. And then increasingly, they're diversifying uh, into explicitly EMF uh, emitting technology. And so these are the companies who control the platforms through which we have to communicate, which means if you're actually interested in reaching as many people as possible, you have to be as accurate and responsible as possible in your messaging. Otherwise, you give them just the excuse to, to start hiding the information. Yeah, and that's a that's a great point. That unfortunately, a lot of I, I see people that are extremely intelligent uh, PhD scientists uh, in physics, for example, who oftentimes claim, "Oh, there's no damage; it doesn't do anything; it's non-ionizing radiation." A lot of engineers, do, especially people in the industry, they seem to be caught up in this line of thinking that there's no effect whatsoever because it's very convenient to think that. So I see. I, I've contacted, you know, the heads uh, behind LiFi, for example, and and I said um, I want to do an interview with someone, but about the health effects, <laughs> and then they stopped emailing me, and I said, well, maybe you should talk with Alexander Wunsch, PhD, who's one of the most the foremost authorities on the effects of of artificial light on hormones, for example, and macular degeneration and things like that. And they didn't answer, like they didn't want anything to do with it. They were interested to put up these conferences in France for industry because it's, yeah, it, it's, it's as if a lot of people are washing their hands like, yeah, well, the health effects, like 
regulatory agencies will take care of that. We are taking care of putting industry people together and thinking about the future of technology and selling products and um, in in a very exciting uh, novel way with 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 this wind of of freshness to the industry like everything is cutting edge and and exciting and and they don't want Nick Pino or R blank to kind of say hey guys we should uh, put a moratorium on even on LEDs like they they don't like these ideas because these are dangerous ideas for an industry uh, you stop progress you stop growth you you stunt the entire industry with these regulations so it's the opposite of free market and, and, and developing these things. So yeah, anyway, no, I, to I, I, I yeah. totally. And, and like I said, I, I was in software development in California for 20 years. I very much know from experience, the, the vibe that you're talking about, yeah. um, where you just get really excited by <laughs> new technology and the opportunity that it offers. Um, and at the same time, I feel like things are starting to change now, not maybe so much with the EMF, but people are the, 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 the dialogue that's happening today is much more open to the notion that technology is harming us. Yeah. Now, yeah. it's not so much yet about EMF, but you see it now really clearly with what's going on with Facebook, but you mm. see it increasingly with the, the laws that are being passed. Uh, in terms of personal information control. You see it in increasing number of studies about what social media is doing to people, especially yeah. teens and children. And so people today are, are much more open to the concept that technology is harmful or can, can be harmful, has harmful aspects to it in a way where even three or four years ago, that discussion was just not happening. I, I agree 100%. And with documentaries that uh, became very mainstream on Netflix, uh, Social that Dilemma, was a, that and was things a great like that, show. Yeah. it's been incredible um, to see that. Uh, and most of them I didn't even see. I should, I should, I should look at them because I know they've been so so impactful. But I know most of the message is industry insiders coming. Uh, a little bit it's almost it's not even whistleblowers now because it's it's almost it's so many engineers that uh, are among the first to create uh, the iPhone or uh, founders of Google or even even uh, someone like the co-founder of Wikipedia who, who came out years ago saying well you know what the information online is being manipulated by people who have certain interests so it it means that people are a little bit more prudent, I think, in how they consume information and technology these days. And it kind of opens the the idea for me that, um, you know, you're, what you're doing, and I want to share the discussion, what you're doing is creating new technologies to combat or reduce the health effects of new technology. So it's using technology <laughs> for technology, So which which is good. Uh, part of it in, in, in my work and in my life, I use a lot of healing technologies. I use uh, red light therapy panels. I use, uh, I've used PEMF, a pulse electromagnetic fields. And there's also the EMF protection world where you say, okay, well, such and such a product should be better regulated. And there's no denying that it's been decades. It should have been done or probably from the get-go when they started introducing cell phones wasn't done and the rules are too permissive and we've established that a thousand times on this podcast so people are very familiar with the problem but then you have emf protection when you type <laughs> emfs in, on amazon well you used to find nick pino now i'm a little bit further down so ah bummer but it's been years from my book so sometimes you find my book you find lloyd burrell you find deborah davis you find overpowered arthur furstenberg all the, the good books are there but along products that i have no idea who manufactured those you have chips pendants pyramids personal product um many things that i don't even understand what like how they've created them with inventors that are nameless companies that are generic or come from china or some like i can't even find a website so the emf protection space is huge and unregulated and then what's happening is i mean i claim well you know my nickname the emf guy i tried to decipher what's true what's not and offer people solutions and i'm lost i'm completely lost as far as what emf protection 
thingies work or not. So I've been going back and forth on EMF protection. Do we do I endorse a certain case? Does it really work? What's the testing? And then it gets into the engineering. So it becomes very difficult for a non-engineer to read the test reports. So I rely on other people and scientists that I also work with a little bit. But um, I people that have your degree of credibility, I want to hear from. So this is really why I'm excited to have this conversation. And let's start with the fundamental. What is EMF protection according to you? Because I think it's important to define the terms first. Okay. So, I mean, so specifically, right, I know you want to focus on EMF protection products. EMF protection is the practice or the process of reducing your exposure to EMF radiation. And before we get into the products, I just want to underscore for everybody, even I, as someone who makes and sells protection products, would really emphasize that the first step in EMF protection is reducing that exposure in the first place before investing in products. Yeah. Um, and without going into too much detail on that, you know, it comes down to the two rules, which is to minimize your use of EMF emitting technology and to maximize your distance from that technology when it is in use. So gotcha. those yeah. are ultimately the best forms of protection. Now, in today's world, uh, those, you know, those, those, those work well, uh, but they, they aren't a complete solution to the problem because there are so many sources of EMF. And, you know, even if you know you shouldn't carry your phone in your pocket, maybe it's a requirement for your job. Uh, or even if you know you shouldn't use your laptop in your lap, maybe you have to work on your laptop while you're commuting on a plane or on a bus or whatever it might be. So, so there, there, there's all of these sources of EMF that even once you've taken the basic steps to protect yourself, you then... Uh, can consider investing in additional levels of protection. So that's where EMF protection products come in. Now, as you note, um, EMF protection products are entirely unregulated. Um, and that leaves the uh, industry very, and consumers of the industry very susceptible to, to snake oil. Um, so there are a lot of products out there that make all sorts of kind of crazy broad claims um, that are unsubstantiated. And when you get down to it, unsubstantiatable, they can't even be verified, even if you went to that, 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 uh, that level. Now, uh, the SYB products, except, except for the headsets, which work a little differently, they're all based on EMF shielding technology. This is universally accepted technology for almost 200 years since Michael Faraday created the, the first Faraday cage. And what he showed is if you weave conductive metals into certain patterns, you can deflect electromagnetic radiation in the opposite direction. And in, in the time since then, uh, it's become possible to create those weaves, those patterns using uh, microscopic fibers, you know, thinner than the human hair. And so you can weave these shielding uh, fabrics and these shielding materials into, into products like my phone pouch or like a blanket or like underwear. Um, these types of products, uh, are, are based, like I said, are based on universally accepted science. They are also demonstrable. They're demonstrable. The, 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 the claims that, that SYB makes and other companies like SYB, they are verifiable in a lab. And in many cases, they are verifiable by you at home with a meter. Now, I kind of lumped shielding, uh, everything that's not shielding as a separate product from shielding. There are other types of EMF protection products that also have demonstrable claims. So for instance, I, I, I just heard your, your interview with the, the, the gentleman from SATIC, uh, dirty electricity filters make yeah. demonstrable claims. Um, uh, but then there's, the, and that's just another example, but then there are whole sets of products out there that can make claims, but they are not verifiable. They are not testable. And these range from everything to from, you know, stickers, little stickers on your phone to crystals, uh, to harmonizers and neutralizers, pendants, and uh, those just, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know what to say about them, except that you can't prove what they're claiming they do. Now, that doesn't mean they don't do what they're claiming to do. It means you can't know one way or the other. Um, I talked to, you know, some, some have better reputations than others. Um, and, you know, I talk to customers all the time, and some say, I tried this and it worked. I tried this, it didn't. 
Um, and so, it, but it's hard for someone like me and I imagine someone like you to sort of recommend these types of products because the claims are not demonstrable. They are not verifiable. They are not measurable. So that's kind of how I view EMF protection products. I never recommend the types of products that don't have measurable, demonstrable, verifiable claims. Um, and although, you know, I don't, if, if someone's using it and they say it's working for them, I certainly don't tell them to stop. Uh, but but um, I only, SYB's focus is on these shielding materials and these shielding products. And with these types of products, you can actually see with, you know, if you buy, if, you, if you're willing to spend $160 on a decent meter, you can actually see the products work. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And um, two of the last interviews of my previous uh, season for Smarter Tech have been focused on uh, talking about EMF harmonizing products with Pavel Wipiszowski, who's an engineer and EMF mitigation specialist from Poland. And the 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 idea is you you've got some demonstrable uh, effects on better HRV when you talk on the phone and various things and they've been uh, tested at the Bion uh, the Bion Institute or or labs such as these where you do have scientists that review some of the evidence and small small subject groups so it's not necessarily statistically significant but the problem I have with those is the marketing, really. Um, if if they said, I saw some companies be a little bit cleaner in their claims, and I like that, uh, where they say, well, you, you're exposed to electropollution all the time, and this will remove a little bit of the stress related to electropollution, uh, or you know, make you a little bit more relaxed, even in situations of eye, eye exposures. And this is probably true. And some people feel it. And especially I know from people that are extremely electrosensitive that some of these solutions have made a difference. I talked with Peter Sullivan on this podcast, who's uh, a, a philanthropist and also ex-software engineer and electro hypersensitive that has been recovering for years and is, is way better now, but he can feel the difference with some technologies, but he doesn't claim his protection. His main protection is having a home completely shielded, um, dirty electricity filtration, and he really understands these things. So I think used in a context, they can be useful, but saying they're protective is is where my issue is. If you have a pendant or something on your person, you're not protected your maybe you have some resilience that is additional but saying is protective i think for most consumers it means okay well i have a this this imaginary bubble that completely protects me against these effects but what kind of liability are these companies exposing themselves to if they yeah. tell people to talk on the phone for hours? We know this is linked with an increase in glioblastomas, a doubling now in the UK. And, and, and the science is kind of catching up where we're going towards a classification two-way or one. And when this happens, I mean, you can claim your pendant protects people, but you got to be careful because what if people still get a brain tumor? It's anyway, it's just... I, no, I'm I, I very see the concerned. Same, I see the same thing. The I have I share the concern, and I see the same issue playing out in the marketing materials, even for shielding companies. So companies that make uh, products like SYBs um, that have lab testing that that have measurable claims, you know, they still show. You know, th they'll use wording that makes people kind of believe that they're 100 percent protected. They'll yeah. show models holding phones up to their head in, 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 the, in the product photos. And I mean, if you look through all of my products, you know, all of my photos, and we have a library of tens of thousands of product photos, there's not one person holding a phone up to their head in any oh, of them. Oh, that's good. Because that that's is good. not a use case. Yeah. You know, that is not something that anyone should ever, ever do. And um, I feel like a lot of companies in my space, uh, uh, are playing fast and loose with the marketing language. I mean, when it comes to marketing, you're always playing a little bit um, to, to, with, with people's emotions because that's what marketing is. Yeah. But you have to do it in as responsible a way as possible. I mean, because 
you know, a company like SYB, we are selling protection, we are selling relief, but we are not selling complete protection, we are not selling complete relief. And there's a lot of education that has to go around, not just how you have to use the product optimally, but other lifestyle changes that really go along with the product use uh, to really get the most protective results that, that you possibly can. Yeah, and this is this is conscious capitalism. I mean, and you're talking to someone who I've been accused of being, oh, Nick Pino is a marketer. I saw an Amazon review the other day. Nick Pino is not that much of an author. He's a marketer. And, and I mean, <laughs> I have a background in copywriting. I spent years. I do online marketing. I do affiliate marketing. So sometimes I, I, I play in both worlds where I have to market my book and say, guys, this is a very urgent and an important health issue EMS. So I write in a certain way. Yes, it raises emotions, but it, it's, yeah, it's always playing with the, the scientific truth and also something that sells if you want. But, and I hate, it's not that I hate doing it. It's not my favorite part of, but I'm, I'm a, I'm a for profit guy. I'm not a nonprofit. Nonprofits can do other things, but at the same yep. time, I understand that we have to, to stay scientifically accurate and then not fall into, for example, fear mongering that I see. I see other people in the EMF space kind of selling selling products, but like, then they sell five, 5G is a kill grid. And I hope it doesn't get banned by YouTube because like of the of the keywords, but who cares? I don't, I like, I mean, the, these kind of things that to me are over the top. And, and I've been talking with um, uh, people in summits and even health coaches and people that have been studying health for decades. And a lot of them are very uneasy with how um, EMFs is being explained and sold in, in that way. And, and when they come across my work, some of them tell me, Nick, finally, I can put EMFs in the environmental toxin world in, in my head and not like the, these marketing messages around like, oh, you put a cell phone to your head and you instantly die. And people are like, well, it doesn't make sense. Like no one is, is dying instantly. So why are you saying that? Well, it's, it's over the top. It's to make you fearful. So this kind of messaging just doesn't, doesn't work. And I don't think it's ethical. So I agree with you that other EMF protection uh, companies did not get my endorsement because exactly of those claims, 100% protection. And I think that the context is so important. And that's something that you do differently on your videos, on your website. And you explain that products need to be used in a certain context. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit because I want to focus on the context of using a phone and having having basically it on on your body as you walk around the city, or maybe you're someone, uh, your boss needs to be, you, you need to be on call. Your boss says, if your phone is, is, is closed, well, you lose your job because you, you, I want you to be available 24 seven. Okay. Well now people reach out to me saying, well, Nick, what do I do? And then I'm a little bit hesitant about the cases that claim hundred percent protection because are you 100% protected? So uh, in reality, I've been going back and forth on different recommendations in my mind. And not to confuse people, I'd rather not endorse anything when it comes to cell phones. And what I tell them is, okay, well, if it's in your pocket, it's on airplane mode. If you carry it, maybe in a bag with distance. But I see that you have a lot of different options. You have, um, and, and I'll let you explain what they are. But you also explain in videos that it's a, they're used in a certain context. And I think that's very important. Like it depends on how you carry your phone and such. So what options do we have when it comes to carrying a, sa a cell phone more safely, if you will? Yeah, no, that's great. So, uh, well, I mentioned earlier that the pocket patch was my first product back from yeah. 2013. And that is a, um, it's a, it's a patch with adhesive on it. So you put it on the inner lining of your pocket and that applies the radiation shielding to the inner lining of your pocket. The key with all of these is that the shielding material itself uh, needs to be positioned between the phone and your body, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, for your phone to work, you can't fully wrap the phone uh, because when you wrap the phone, you're gonna start obstructing the cell signal. So at that exactly. point, just turn it, into, turn it into airplane mode and then everyone will be happier. Uh, so, and it can't be, you know, on the other side of the phone because then more radiation will be ra radi uh, reflected back into your body. So you need the shielding to be between the phone and your body, and that will deflect 
a big chunk of the radiation away from your body while still allowing your phone to work. So the pocket patch is great because you put it on a pocket, you never have to think about it again. It's super thin, you don't even feel it. Um, the issue and limitation there is that you have to put one on every pocket that you, where you carry a phone. And so a few years after that, we released the phone pouch and that was actually the first EMF phone pouch. Um, and the principle is the same. So except it's in a pouch form instead of a pocket liner. So it's a, just a neoprene foam pouch, but the back side of it has radiation shielding uh, lining it. And the front side is just regular neoprene. And so that is designed to be, uh, you put your phone in that pouch and then you put the pouch in your pocket or on your belt. And again, you can carry your phone more safely. And then the, the third product in that uh, same sort of uh, line is the 5G phone shield, which um, we named the 5G phone shield just because it came out in, in 2019. And uh, we thought there might be some interest around 5G, but it's actually the same shielding material that's in the phone pouch. So the shielding material is exactly the same. The difference is it's, a, it's just a card. So instead of a pouch that you have to put your phone in, it's a card and you can slide it between your phone and your body and you only need one, you can move it to whatever pocket you're, you're putting your phone in. Again, the key with all of these is you need the shielding in between your phone and your body. More recently, uh, we released the sling bag, which is, it's, it's like a small backpack. Uh, I don't know if your, your listeners know what sling bags are, but it's like a small backpack that can go over either shoulder. And gotcha. that was designed not just for phones, but also for other portable devices like e-readers and tablets. And you can put it in the sling bag and then carry that. Uh, that happens these days to be my, my favorite SYB product. I, I love my sling bag. Uh, I carry it, uh, all, my, all my stuff in, in my sling bag. And that, that has the benefit of being even a little bit further away from your body than if, if you're using any of my products in your pocket. So those are, and as you note, I have multiple products for this use case uh, for the, the particular issue of cell phones and pockets, because I believe that, um, that cell phones and pockets, even with all of the, the growth in sources of EMF in our environment, the proliferation of smart tech in our homes, more Wi-Fi networks from our neighbors, nearby cell towers. I believe that for people who carry their phones in their pockets, that can be the largest or one of the largest sources yeah. of their own personal exposure because these cell phones are very, very powerful. Uh, they're, they're designed to be able to send signals over many miles if they have to, to reach a, a tower. And when it's up against your body, uh, you are getting a full dose of what that phone has to offer. And when you're carrying it in your pocket, it tends to be for extended periods of time. So I believe that people carrying their phones in their pockets uh, is, is a huge source of individual exposures. Again, even despite the proliferation and all these sources of EMF. And that's why uh, I focused uh, so many different products on giving people options to help solve that. Now, I believe people shouldn't carry their phones in their pockets, uh, or if they do, they should put them into airplane mode. But I also, you know, I, I take a kind of a more practical perspective on this as a someone who runs a company, as someone who deals with consumers, as a marketer, right? People, you know, some people need to, whether it's for work or whether it's not even for work, but where else are they going to carry it? right? To me, it's not the same thing as holding a phone up to your head. Holding a phone up to your head, there's always a better option. Whether that's a headset or a speakerphone, there's a, always a better option than holding a phone up to your head. There's no excuse to ever hold a phone up to your head. But carrying your phone in your pocket is still a huge source of exposure, but one that can, I find more understandable that people can't not, you know, can't, can't avoid. And so that's, um, that's why I have all those products for it. Yeah, this is this is a great point. And um, one thing that I, I was wondering, why did you choose not to have a phone case? Because I see a lot of companies making cases and, and I have one of these cases that closes up, but I'm not comfortable um, recommending those models anymore, especially if they're shielding on both sides, because... I'm I'm yeah. really um, worried. I saw this study. Let me let me open it while while we talk. Real world cell phone radio frequency electromagnetic field exposures by Wall and Al in Environmental Research 2019. What they said is they did testing in in the real world to see how much cell phones can ramp up their signal 
if the connectivity is very low. For example, you're in the middle of nowhere, one, uh, one or two bars out of four or five, and you have low connectivity, then uh, your phone can ramp up its power. And I'm just saying that for the audience. Obviously, you understand these things. But what they said is uh, up to 10,000 fold increase in radiation. So I'm concerned. It means that it's something that even uh, Dr. Deborah Davis, if I, if I recall correctly, in Disconnect said that uh, cases had been tested by my, maybe it was Consumer Reports or another consumer group. And they said, well, we don't recommend any case, even the plastic ones, because of the potential increase in radiation. So how do you ensure that this is not a problem in your shielding solutions? Sure. Okay. So there were a few questions kind of lumped in there, so I'll start. <laughs> sure. Uh, first off, yeah, I agree. You should never use a product, uh, a cell phone sh radiation shield in particular, that shields on multiple sides, because then you are inviting the phone to start increasing its power output. And it could be, be because of the deflection angles and so forth, it could be shooting that radiation. You don't even know where. So, so shielding on multiple sides and to the extent that it actually works, you're just obstructing your signal. So again, just turn it into airplane mode. Now, why I don't, because a lot of radiation cases, or I should say anti-radiation cases only shield on one side. Okay. And so why don't I make a product like that? Um, it's a big part of the market. There's a lot of sales to be had there. Why don't I do that? The reason is because I feel like having that uh, type of product is an encouragement to people to hold their phones up against their head. And that is a use case that I am just so strongly opposed to that that's why I don't uh, SYB has never made a phone case. It is because I fear that it encourages people to hold phones up to their head. And I, again, that it, people should never, ever do that. Uh, and the, the only other time in which you need a radiation shield on a phone is when you're carrying it. And so that's why I make several products for carrying it, but none of them are, none of them help you, to, you know, hold the phone up to your head, you know, quote unquote, more safely. Cause I don't believe there that it, it, even, even if you cut some of the radiation, when you're holding the phone up, it's so much radiation right up there next to your brain, next to your audio, uh, your, your, uh, your nerves and your eyes. And it's just so risky. And again, there's never, it's not, it's, it's not unavoidable. There are always alternatives to holding it up to your head Yeah. now. I, oh, I, so I then yeah. th you asked, um, uh, how do I prevent that with my products? And the answer yeah. there is, um, is that the shielding is on one side only. Uh, and this is true for all of my electronics accessories. None of my electronics accessories are designed to surround a piece of electronics. So that's true for my, my like I mentioned, my phone pouch or the pocket patch. It's true for my laptop pad and tablet pad. It's true for the picture frame, which is, um, it's a shield that's you know, one use case is, uh, is to put it on your nightstand. So if you sleep with your phone, which is another habit that people should break, but it, a lot of people do it, you put your phone behind the picture frame and, and it, it deflects the radiation away from, from your head and your mm. body while you're sleeping. Uh, that's another example. It does not fully surround the product. The products that I do have that create more full shields, there are first the canopies, uh, which create a, a real 360 by 360 enclosed Faraday cage. And then there's also apparel which fully shield specific parts of your body. And those are areas where uh, I, I do want to cover as much as possible because those don't obstruct electronics. Those create protective spaces for you and your body. But when it comes to electronics accessories, it's very important to shield on one side only. This is, well, you've just convinced me. <laughs> like I was waiting, I was looking forward to this conversation because I've been completely... Uh, I, I've been really feeling uneasy about my recommendation around cell phone cases because I, I could not get a good answer about exactly these questions, and and some of them are, if you enclose the the 
part of the antenna, I'm always concerned that with a certain angle, depending on where you're situated vis-a-vis -vis the tower or in certain situations, you're inside in a in a in an enclosed space or a lot of concrete walls around you. I'm like, well, are we really decreasing exposure? And that's my concern. Will I be the one saying, oh yes, everyone buy this product, and then the it increases exposure? So just on a, on on an ethical or moral standpoint, I really want to make sure that a product is um, is is sold by a manufacturer that tells you how to use it and that it's also clear how to use it. I have one of these and I will not name companies. Anyway, these companies are always evolving and uh, I'm not here to kind of, anyway, bash any particular companies. But when you have a flap over, the problem I have with that now that I think of it and now that uh, after hearing your explanations around why we should shield on one side, it's never clear which, which side is shielded and which is not. It's not, in in fact, it's not even explained in their um, in their uh, pamphlet or anything information that comes with the product. So they don't explain unless maybe I'm, I I missed it or even it's been years since I had it. So maybe it was there, but I tossed the entire like the little <laughs> cartons and and things like that. So I I never even thought about it. I thought in my mind it was shielded on two sides. I think it's shielded on one side, but that being said, people need to know which side to use it. So if you have the phone that's completely enclosed with these flaps, you don't really think twice about it and maybe you're putting it on the wrong side. So now yeah. you have shielding that is reflecting back to you, which is a shame. In reality, it, it kind of does the opposite of what we're trying to achieve here. So um, I'm convinced and I need to get <laughs> to get the, to get a pouch or, or something for my pocket. It is very rare that I use my phone in a, in a pocket. I could take a call from time to time. Usually I just try to avoid those or uh, use a speaker phone or something like that. But I agree that um, just just to comment on what you said previously, phone on the head, we know this is the most dangerous use of phones. At least the science is the strongest when it comes to, maybe it can be acoustic neuromas that can lead to complications, including death uh, or loss of hearing or neural function. Even even the parotid glands or, or thyroid cancers could be fatal also, but the glioblastomas are really something not, not to be messed with. But then my concern is is this data that I keep hearing from scientists about the increase in uh, uh, cancers of the groin area, ovarian cancer, uh, 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 testicular cancer, prostate cancer, and in the youth. So makes and, you wonder. And colorectal. Um, colorectal also, and geez, I'm I'm very concerned that we're we've just shifted the problem. Most most young people these days, if you call them, they feel weird, weirded out. Like, oh, why are you calling me? You should text me, right? <laughs> or you should, you know, like it's almost a, a, a running gag in in people like thirty and younger, even my generation. Like, I'm I'm thirty four. Like, oh, you're calling me? Like, people are like, oh my god, I haven't called someone in years. But <laughs> now the problem is shifting. It's phone in the pocket. Uh, streaming Spotify or, or 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 podcasts and with very high intensity, right? Because the streaming mm -hmm. services are always going, going, going. But now we're not talking about using the phone on the ear 30 minutes per day as a defined as a heavy user in science, which is nonsensical in itself. But uh, we're talking about sometimes 15 hours per day. So it's also mm -hmm. the time of use in the pocket that is tremendous. So I agree with you. Um, in in your statement that probably this is the highest level of exposure, and I would be um, interested to see a scientific study uh, with with a, a kind of dosimeter or or something like that to see where is the strongest exposure coming from in, in and in age ranges because I think the younger you are, the most likely you are to maybe not talk on the ear but just move the problem away to another organ, which is. If it's bad here, do you think it's bad there on the pocket? Well, probably it is. And even <laughs> yeah. right in, in in the bra, something that I've been telling for years is, my God, you don't want to like choose choose where you want cancer, <laughs> basically. Unfortunately, <laughs> I mean, and it's not guaranteed. Obviously, I don't want to make that overstatement, but yeah, it's it, it's not good. Choose where you want risks to your health, basically. So yeah, it, yeah, it's, and, it's and very it's very interesting. It's important, I feel, to remind people, which again, I know you know, but something doesn't have to cause cancer for it to really mess with your health. And there's a whole wide range of negative health effects linked, convincingly linked 
to these types of exposures, yeah. you know, that are far short of cancer, uh, but you still want to avoid um, from, you know, pardon me, at the low end, you know, sleep disruption and anxiety up through um, infertility, subfertility, birth defects, miscarriage. There's, there's just such a whole wide range of health effects linked to these yeah. types of exposures. Cancer obviously gets a lot of the attention because it is such a terrifying condition. Um, but the, 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 the basically EMF, and again, I know you know this, but <laughs> it, it, any system that you measure, you see that EMF affects that system. And it does something doesn't have to cause cancer for uh, for you for it to be causing a lot of damage to your body. I agree 100 percent. And um, I'm glad that we tackled the cell phone issue. So what I'm and let me know if I, I my summary is good. My understanding right now is, uh, of course, don't use it on the head if or, or just in extreme emergencies but it shouldn't it should not be something and i've been telling that to my dad and if he's listening he's still not listening to me he's a realtor my my uh brother also and they're both still using it on the air and on the head and i see them though they started like talking like this so they kind of think about it and it's true <laughs> that at two centimeters it's good that they're doing that but just change your habits guys anyway so if you're Having it in the pocket, shielding one side, so the shield near your body and the phone reflecting away from you, right? So that's, is that correct? Yes? Yes. Okay. So now in part two of this interview, we're going to dive into the wired earbuds. And when you create that distance, can, it, can we have a problem with the cell phone signal going up the wire? That's something I've been hearing for years. It was in my book and I'm still not convinced. So we're going to dive into part two. Uh, and in, in the meantime, you can visit shieldyourbody.com. That's the right URL. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Shieldyourbody.com. Okay. Yep. Well, thank you. I'm going to see you in part two. And uh, people just listening to this as it comes out, it's going to come out in two weeks. So stay tuned for that. Uh, R, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure.